Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Dejatarine Vanchakaupa Terubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayeva Cha Patita Nam Pavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namah Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Everyone can see the slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Yes, ma'am. Good. Okay. So, beginning the ninth chapter. Let's look at what we want to accomplish this evening. We want to explain the terms confidential, more confidential, and most confidential with reference to the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, first verse of the ninth chapter. That shouldn't be too difficult for you. Then, second item, the main philosophical points of the Raja Vidya verse, 9-2, second verse, Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam, right? The main philosophical points, there's a long purport there, we have to go through the purport and pick out the main philosophical points. Cite the example of Narada in relation to Pratyakshavagamam in the second verse of the ninth chapter. That's connected with that point. And finally, present Krishna's relationship with the material world with reference to Sanskrit terms and analogies given in Bhagavad Gita. 9.4 to 9.10. So that's an interesting item to look at this evening. So this is what we want to cover this evening. We're just going to take a look at the first ten verses of the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter is the heart of the Bhagavad Gita, coming in the middle of the Bhagavad Gita. So it's the heart. Just like the middle section is the heart of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7 to 12 are the heart. So the heart of that, that section is here in this ninth chapter. So many important slokas and important points we want to look at. Okay, connection with the previous chapter. Someone can read? In 8th chapter, Krishna has explained that, that the Ananya devotee surpasses both the path of light and darkness. Now Krishna will explain how to become such an Ananya devotee. The first step is hearing about Krishna. Okay. Can you tell me what is an, an, an what is the meaning of an ananya devotee? Pure devotee, Maharaj. Huh? Pure devotee. Pure devotee. Uh, Maharaj, a devotee who uh, worships only Krishna and no one else. Okay. Please surrender. Undeviating devotion. Undeviating devotion. Undeviating devotion. Yes, that's a nice way to put it. I think that's very nice. Undeviating devotee to Krishna. His devotion to Krishna is without deviation. He's completely absorbed in the service of Krishna. Very nice. Unalloyed devotee. Unalloyed, 
pure unalloyed devotion, yes. <laughs> that that word, <laughs> I I never heard that word used until Pra Prabhupada has his own u unique way of using these different words. Uh. Pure devotion, unalloyed. Prabhupada saw the word when he when he, he came on the boat on the Jaladuta into Boston and there was a there was a big sign up that said pure unalloyed steel. So unalloyed, un unalloys, no analloy, no no al no alloys. Usually they will put alloys in metals to give it different qualities, but without alloys. <laughs> so Prabhupada coined that phrase in describing devotional service, unalloyed devotional service. Very unique. Prabhupada has his own unique way of using the English language. Very interesting. Okay, so the first step is hearing about Krishna, right? We're, we heard that before in the, the beginning of the seventh chapter, the, the importance of hearing about Krishna. Do you remember? In the first verse of the seventh chapter, it begins, now hear from me, O Arjuna, how by practicing yoga and consciousness of me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. Touch Shrinu, right. Hear from me. So hearing. So similarly here also in the ninth chapter, Krishna will explain how to become an ananya devotee. And the first step is to hear about Krishna. All right? And the first verse will describe how we should hear about Krishna, right? Let's see. Oh. oh. Right? Someone like to read? First one is most confident. First, one, First is most one is most confidential because it describes pure unalloyed devotional service. The beginning chapter of Bhagavad Gita describes confidential knowledge of the difference between the soul and the body. Chapters 7 and 8 are more confidential because they describe devotional service which brings enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. Okay. So chapter 7 and 8 are more confidential. The beginning chapters of Bhagavad Gita describe confidential knowledge. Confidential knowledge, the difference between the body and the soul. That was there in the second chapter. And then chapter 7 and 8 comes to more confidential knowledge because they're describing devotional service. Particularly they're describing who comes to devotional service and who doesn't. We hear this kind of thing. So now the ninth chapter is going to bring us the most confidential knowledge. When, when we go on to the 18th chapter, it will describe another way of describing knowledge which is confidential, more confidential, and most confidential. The 18th chapter, 63 and 64, describe knowledge of Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So knowledge of Brahman is confidential, guyam. Knowledge of Paramatma is guyataram, more confidential. 
and Bhagavan realization is guyatamam, most confidential. So we see a different ways of describing what is confidential, what is more confidential, and what is the most confidential. Right? Let's look at this again. Chapters here in Prabhupada's purport of the first verse, Prabhupada is describing that confidential knowledge is the difference between the body and the soul. Seven and eight is confidential because it describes devotional service. But chapter nine is the most confidential. Why would it be the most confidential? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj, because here we talk about that, uh, how we move from Paramatma realizations to the God realizations by developing more prema or uh, uh, more intimate relations with the Lord. Well, chap we said chapter 7 and 8 was describing devotional service, so we were already into devotional service, right? So. Chapter 9 is going to give us more confident, the most confidential knowledge. Pure devotion. Huh? Pure devotion. Pure devotion, yes. And particularly how Krishna relates with his pure devotees. We'll see that the relationship between Krishna and his pure devotees. Let's see here. Yeah, reading from the purport of the first verse, and Prabhupada writes there, uh, but, but the matters which are described in the ninth chapter deal with unalloyed pure devotion. Therefore, this is called the most confidential. One who is situated in the most confidential knowledge of Krishna is naturally transcendental. He therefore has no material pangs, although he is in the material world. In the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, it is said that although one who has a sincere desire to render to, to render loving service to the to the supreme lord is situated in the confidential state of material existence he is to be considered liberated similarly we shall find in the bhagavad gita 10th chapter that anyone who is engaged in that way is a liberated person. All right. So, Prabhupada said, one may have a, a, a he may have a, a, a genuine desire. He has a sincere desire to render loving service to the Lord. Uh, although one who has. Uh, Because he has a sincere desire to render service to the Supreme Lord, he's situated in, although he's in the conditioned state of material existence, he is to be considered liberated. So this is special nature. Although we're conditioned souls, conditioned but if we are engaged in devotional service, if we have that sincere desire to render service unto the Lord, then we are considered liberated. There's a verse like that. 
Nicholas Papiavastu stood, Jivan Mukta Suchati, one who's engaged his with his body, mind and words in the service of Krishna, he's considered to be a liberated soul even in this life. So he's Jivan Mukta, although he is a, in the material body, he's considered a, a liberated soul. Okay. Yes. How do we understand the word confidential? Because the uh, this information is available to the whole world in Bhagavad Gita. Yes, it's available for the whole world in Bhagavad Gita. But who's reading the Bhagavad Gita? Who's taking the Bhagavad Gita seriously and trying to understand it? So in that sense, it's confidential. You say the whole world is reading Bhagavad Gita. I don't believe it. How many people are reading Bhagavad Gita? And there are so many Bhagavad Gitas. And they're not all presenting the truth. Prabhupada talks about that. The first verse. Let's read the first verse. What does the first verse say? Hmm? Well, let's read, we can read the Sanskrit. Sri Bhagavan Vajja Idam Tute Guyatamam Prapakshiyami Anasuyave. Right? People are envious. Who are these envious people? Prabhupada describes who is envious. Who is he talking about? Huh? The atheist Maharaj. The atheist, those who say that we don't believe or. Uh... Yeah, atheists, but who, and, but then in this purport, Prabhupada particularly talks about people who are envious, beside the atheist. Mayavadis? Yes, mental speculators and Mayavadis, these people who they, they don't understand the Bhagavad Gita properly and they they, they give the Bhagavad Gita as they think it is, right? Mm. In Prabhupada's purport, he writes about that at the end of the purport. The Sanskrit word, Anasuyave, in this verse, is also a very, a, a very significant it's very significant. Generally, the commentators, even if they are highly scholarly, are all envious of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Even the most erudite scholars write on Bhagavad Gita very, very inaccurately because they are envious of Krishna. So, Prabhupada is talking, you know, these people, they're commentators on the Bhagavad Gita. They're very big scholars. They're writing their books, the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada said they're just envious of Krishna. And they minimize Krishna's position in the Bhagavad Gita. But they take advantage of Krishna's book to present their own philosophy. So, envious. So, confidential. This knowledge is confidential in the sense that not everybody can appreciate it and understand it. That is the fact. So we have confidential knowledge, more confidential knowledge, and the most confidential. In other words, confidential knowledge may be, you know, maybe like how many people, you could maybe like 5% people know, 5% is maybe that's a lot, you know, how many people actually know Bhagavad Gita? Anyway, roughly, say, say something like 5%, and then more confidential mean you're coming down to 2%, and then most confidential maybe 0.1%, like that. So it becomes more and more rare as, as we go on as we come through these different levels of confidentiality. What is confidential, what is more confidential, and what is the most confidential? 
confidential knowledge is known also, also by the Mayavadis. They also know we're not the body. Bhagavad Gita describes the difference between the body and the soul. So the Mayavadis, they also know this. They know we're not the body, we're a soul. Right? They have that. But they don't, they may not have devotional service. Generally they don't. So that's more confidential. How many people actually take up devotional service and understand Lord Krishna and his energies? Seventh chapter, remember we described the people who surrender and who don't like that. So how many of them actually surrender to take up devotional service? That is more confidential. But the most confidential knowledge is describing Lord Krishna's relationship with those pure, unalloyed devotees who are ananya bhaktas. Right? So what is, this, what is the special qualifications which are given there in the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, Anasuya be right. Shouldn't be envious. Shouldn't be envious of Krishna. Right? Anything else? I can't hear you, Prabhu. Knowledge. Knowledge about. Knowledge of what? About the devotional service. How to render a devotional Different activities. Krishna is going to give this most confidential knowledge and realization. Knowing which you'll be relieved of the miseries of material existence. So we want to get relief from the miseries of material. We'll be, the result of this knowledge, anyway will be relieved the miseries of material existence. Yes, we have to have... Krishna said we're, he's going to impart this knowledge to us. And our qualification is that we should not be envious of Krishna. And that we're ready to... that means we're ready to hear from him and to receive this knowledge from him. All right. So the 18th chapter describes the confidential, more confidential, most confidential in a different manner. Something we're more familiar with is Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. So you'll get that in the third section of the Bhagavad Gita. All right, Prabhupada explains. Someone please read. This is from the first verse. The very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, the first chapter, is more or less an introduction to the rest of the book. And in the second and third chapters, the spiritual knowledge described is called confidential. Topics discussed in the seventh and eighth chapters are specifically related to devotional service. And because they bring enlightenment in Krishna consciousness, they are called more confidential. But the matters which are described in the ninth chapter deal with analyzed pure devotion. Therefore, this is called the most confidential. Bhagavad Gita 9.14. 
Okay, thank you. So we're looking at the most confidential topics here. Yes? Someone please read. How can the soul, which is so active within this body, be inactive after being liberated from the body? It is always active. If it is eternal, then it is eternally active and its activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. These activities of the spirit soul are therefore indicated here as constituting the king of all knowledge, the most confidential part of all knowledge. Bhagavad Gita 9.2 All right, so Prabhupada is presenting this argument here. Because people say that the soul ultimately is going to merge into the oneness. So Prabhupada is arguing that how can they say like that? And he said that the soul is so active within the body, how is it that after liberation he's going to have no activity? So Prabhupada is presenting the message of Lord Chaitanya to defeat this impersonalism. He wants, us, he wants people to understand the actual position of the soul. So this is in relation to knowledge, king of knowledge. And the Raja, Raja Vidya Raja Guyam, the king of knowledge the king of education. Ordinary people are bewildered. They are thinking that the soul is active, but after liberation, then there's no, no activity. But Prabhupada said the soul is eternally active. Its activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. Ordinary people are not able to understand the nature of Krishna's activities in the spiritual world. And that we see the ninth offense in chanting the holy name, to instruct faithless persons about the glories of the holy name. They cannot even understand the power of the Holy Name. How can they ever understand Krishna's activities in the spiritual world? So we have to be cautious about presenting the nature of Krishna's spiritual activities or the spiritual activities of the living entities in the spiritual world. It's a very confidential subject matter. One has to be qualified to hear it. Generally, public assemblies, we won't speak about Rasa Leela and Krishna's pastimes with the gopis. People are not qualified to hear. It's a very confidential part of knowledge. So, this knowledge is Raja Vidya, Raja Guya. It's the knowledge of kings, or uh, it is uh, like a king has treasure. So this is the treasure of the kings. This is the real knowledge, the real education, right? and it, it, it's confidential because ordinary people are not able to begin to understand it. If we are to tell people about Krishna's rasa lila, we see how people become so bewildered, they cannot understand, and they completely degrade the whole situation. So it's important to, for us to understand why this knowledge is confidential.
trying to get people to understand the soul itself is a big endeavor. We want to have that kind of education. People may say, oh, I know I'm the soul, but then they may know, but they never act like a soul. So it's not just simply knowing, but it's actually applying the knowledge and realizing it. So this is required. And then it becomes actually spiritual. So Raja Vidya, Raja Guya, it's the most secret of all secrets, the king of education, king of knowledge. It is also Pavitra. It is pure. Uh, pavitram in the sense that, pure in the sense that it, not like, just like the sun can purify everything. So this, this is, knowledge is completely pure, the purest knowledge. It is not to be contaminated by the nonsense of materialistic people. We, want, we have to keep it pure, we have to protect it. That's why we make it confidential. And it's Uttamam, it's the highest. And then pragyakshvavagamam, pragyaksha, directly perceived, right? In Ishopanishad, Prabhupada describes different ways of perceiving knowledge, right? You, with the senses, we, there is pragyaksha, direct perception. There's three levels of acquiring knowledge. There's pragyaksha, anuman, and shabda. So pragyaksha, here you see pragyakshavagamam, it's direct, direct perception of the self by realization. Susukam, it is joyfully performed. And it is avyayam, everlasting. So we want to look at these different aspects as they are described in Prabhupada's purport here. Prabhupada goes through each of these terms and explains them, beginning with his Raja Vidya, Raja Guya. And he explains there's so many educational institutes, they're giving knowledge, they're giving education, but they don't give the real education. They, they educate some temporary mundane science. You know what you learn today, another ten years is out of date. You won't use it anymore. And now we're all, you know, we're very digitalized, but we don't know how long the digital systems, these th things will last. And what will come next, we don't know. What we were using, years ago is already out of date. Science and technology all changes so fast. But this knowledge, this is eternal knowledge. So this is Raja Vidya, Raja Kuya, the king of education. Other education systems, all useless in the course of time. But this education is of eternal benefit. This photograph is very interesting. This photograph is taken from the early years of our movement. 
and this is in when the devotees were in Boston. At that time we had the BBT Press in Boston. So the, the artists were all there and the editors and the devotees were even printing the books themselves. They purchased a printing press and they were trying to print their own books. So all the devotees, they would go on Sankirtan in Boston. And if you've been to Boston, there's a, there's a place called the Common, which is like common land in the center of the city. It's kind of like a park or something. And so the devotees would go there and chant. And you can see how they're all dressed in yellow and white. And there's a, th this picture is not, is, there's another picture which was on the cover of Back to Godhead. And all the devotees, you could see their faces, they were so effulgent, they were so joyful, it was such a very blissful sankirtan they were having. So they showed the photo to Prabhupada, and they said, Prabhupada, you see, everyone's so happy. And Prabhupada said, yeah, this is sankirtan. He said, everyone gets the mercy. He said, this is like the machine gun. If the other people come with a gun, shoot one or two people, but machine gun, everyone gets a mercy. So Sankirtan, everyone gets a mercy. So Pradyaksha, by direct experience, Avagamam, understood. We can directly experience the nature of devotional service. It's perceived. You can see it in the faces of the devotees. Susukam kartam avyayam. They're very joyful and happy. Prabhupada explains. Someone read? If you are hungry and are given very nice, uh, nutritious, palatable food, you don't have to take any advice from others. You will understand yourself. Yes, I am now feeling strong. I am now feeling energetic. This is called Pratyakshavagama Dharmiyam. Similarly, if you have, if you take to Krishna consciousness, that is the process, then you will feel automatically how you are satisfied. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 9.1, Yurundavan. If you take to Krishna Consciousness, you'll feel automatically how you are satisfied. Right? We should be. Prabhupada was concerned to see the devotees bright-faced and happy. <laughs> there, there was the one devotee, he was actually Prabhupada's secret, uh, servant, and uh, it was at the time of the moon landing, and this particular devotee, he had a doubt about the moon landing. So he didn't believe, Prabhupada said, Prabhupada was telling him, this is not the moon, but he was convinced it's the moon. No, they're on the moon, Prabhupada, this is the moon. Isn't it amazing? We've landed on the moon, the, the spacemen are on the moon. Prabhupada said, this is not the moon, this is not the moon, this is not true. And the devotee couldn't believe it and he couldn't accept Prabhupada's words and he became very morose. And so Prabhupada said to him, he said, if you are morose, you cannot be in Krishna consciousness. One who is morose is not Krishna conscious. That's a Brahma Buddha Prasanatma. Right? One who is one who is in Krishna consciousness should be Brahma Buddha. He knows he's not the body, he knows he's Brahman, he's, and the nature of Brahman is prasanatma, joyful soul. So we should feel that, we should feel satisfied. The devotional service itself, susukam kirtam avya, it's joyfully performed. If you are not happy in performing your devotional service, it's not devotional service. This, that is not devotional service. If you're not happy, you're not doing devotional service. We have to perform this service with a loving mood. 
with great pleasure that I'm so happy, I, I like to do this for Krishna. And we should feel that satisfaction, that pleasure that I'm doing this for Krishna. And you, we want to do it, right? And what exa which example is given there in the purport? Yes? The example that is given is about the uh, very nice nutritious food. So you get satisfaction automatically once you eat it. Yeah. Well, that's not what I was thinking about. Anyway, it comes up here. We'll show here. Narada Muni chanting the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. Right? Within the purport, Prabhupada talks about Narada Muni. Why does he talk about Narada Muni? What's it, how does it relate to Prakyak Shavagamam? Narada Muni is blissfully chanting the holy names of the Lord eternally. So he's experiencing the bliss. That's why. And how did he get that bliss? How did he get to that position of Narada Muni? By, by practicing the devo pure devotional service. And who did he by learn? Who did he learn pure devotional service from? By associating with Sadhguru. Huh? By associating with Sadhguru. He served the city. He served the sages. The sages came to his house and he served them. Right? Yes. What did he do for them? He served them. How did he, he serve them? How did he did he menial service and also took the remnants of the Pakiri Yes, he got. Did he, how did he get the remnants? Did he steal the remnants? By taking permission from the saints. Yes, he took the permission from the sages. With their permission. It says he, never, he, he always behaved very well. He was well behaved. He served the sages. Sometimes he would bring their food. Um, of course, his mother, being a woman, she would not directly go and serve the sages. The son would help her and he would take the food to the sages. And the sages were very kind to him. With their permission, he was allowed to take their remnants of the food and he would also sit and hear them discuss. He would hear them discuss topics of the Lord and he would hear them chant the holy name. So he, would, he learned from them how to absorb his mind in the service of the Lord. And so by their association, he was able to experience this, uh, this pratyak shavagamam dharmyam, this, he was able to directly perceive the pleasure of devotional service. And that's why today he is eternally chanting the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. Because he has, he has actually had the experience, he's perceived the, the nectar of the holy name. Oh. Let's go back. We're not finished text number two yet. Uh, we want to look at chapter, at verse number two. Let's go through the purport and pick out the main philosophical points here in this verse. Right? First of all, Prabhupada is discussing the Rajavidya, Rajaguyam part about different types of education and the need for education about the soul, right? And then what is the next part of the purport? Raja Vidya Raja Guyam 
pavitram, right? Purest. How does Prabhupada present this argument that this process is the purest? Everyone read the purport? Chapter 9, text number 2. Why is this knowledge the purest? Because it gives direct perception of the self by realization. Because of the purifying potency of devotional service, as it cleanses all the sinful reaction. Yes, that's the point I'm looking for, right. It takes away the sinful reactions, right? What is the example? The example is about the seed of a tree's sown. The tree does not appear immediately to grow, it takes some time, Maharaj. Yes. And what about the sinful, re sinful reactions? How are they removed? Maharaji, for sinful reactions, it also takes its time to fructify. Uh, so, both uh, uh, de uh, devotion or sinful reactions, both, uh, it, it, it has been compared with uh, showing the three seed and it uh, germinates and grow and finally fructify its bear flower and fruit. So both the process is slow, whether downfall or uh, up movements, both are in a slow process and it's more sequential. Uh -huh. But the process of devotional service itself can remove all the different phases of sinful reaction. Right? Pious activities, Maharaj. What? What about pious activities? When the devotee goes for pious activities in lieu of fruitive activities, what will happen? Then there will be no sinful reaction. Well, pious activities is not the best way to counteract sinful activities. Pious activities, that's just like the bathing of the elephant. That's just like the process of atonement. You know, if you... The elephant may, may bathe and then it comes out rose in the dirt. So you do pious activities, that's not going to counteract sinful activities. It's not going to take away the desire for sin. So what is being stressed here is the process of devotional service, not pious activities. No, it's, it's devotional service which is the purest. Pious activities doesn't take away the desire for sin. But if we do devotional service, that will take away the desire for sin. It burns out the root of desire for sin. So this is, this is the point which is made here. This is why devotional service is described as being the purest because it removes even the desire for sinful activities from the heart. All right? And then we go on after the purest uh, pavitram idam uttamam. Uh, this knowledge is the purest and because it gives direct perception of the self, 
by realization. So direct perception of the self, this example is in relation to Narada Muni. Prabhupada in the purport then goes into the life of Narada Muni. And he describes about Narada Muni's life as a young boy and how he got the blessings of the sages by, take, by serving them, taking the remnants of their food and hearing them talk about the Lord. So in this way his attraction for devotional service was aroused through their association. And he could directly experience the pleasure, the, the, the potency of these spiritual activities. There has to be, there has to be that attraction to take up devotional service. So that direct perception, you can actually perceive it yourself. It's not just something, oh I heard about this, you can directly experience it. We go on Harinam, I was showing you the picture of all those devotees chanting. They, were, they could experience the bliss of being out on Harinam and chanting the holy name with all the devotees. It was so powerful. In the same way Narada Muni, he's eternally chanting. He doesn't get tired, he doesn't get bored. It's, it's, it's eternal. Rather, the more he chants, the more he wants to chant. We want to do, go and distribute the glories of Krishna and his holy name. That is the nature of devotional service. So, pratyakshavagamam dharmyam. You can perceive it. You can experience it directly. We have to have that, that taste for these activities. Okay, and, and then Susu come, joyful. We should feel like the, the, the life of the devotee, the lifestyle of the devotee is very joyful. No anxiety, not worried. You know, we've left behind all the problems of the material world to come into Krishna consciousness. So that is real liberation. You feel very happy, you feel really liberated. You know, you've left behind everything. All the problems of the material world, they're all dropped. And we've just taken up Krishna consciousness and absorbed ourselves in chanting the holy name. So the process itself is very joyful and it's avyayam, it's eternal, just like Narada Muni, eternal spaceman. So it doesn't change. It's not like, oh, this time I have to do it this way, in the future we'll do it a different way. No, it's always there. It's always devotional service. And chanting the holy name is always there also. Although in other ages there are different processes, but there's always the chanting of the holy name. In every age there's the chanting of the holy name. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, uh, let's see. I'll just read from the purport here. Uh, it is said that the execution of devotional service is so perfect that one can perceive the results directly. The direct result is actually perceived and we have practical experience that any person who is chanting the holy name of Krishna in course of, 
in the course of chanting without offense feels some transcendental pleasure and very quickly becomes purified of all material contamination. This is actually seen. Furthermore, if one engages not only in hearing but engages himself in helping the missionary activities of Krishna consciousness, he gradually feels spiritual progress. This advancement in spiritual life does not depend on any kind of previous activities or previous education or qualification. The method itself is so power is so pure that by simply engaging in it one becomes pure. So it does no previous qualification, doesn't matter educated or not educated. And we see examples of great devotees. You know, Garuda is a bird, Hanuman's a monkey. Uh, Gajendra was an elephant. They all became pure devotees. Ajamila was very sinful. Maharaj? Yes? Uh, uh, in the last paragraph of the purport, Prabhupada mentions after one is liberated, when one is situated in the Brahman position, Brahma Bhuta, one's devotional service begins. So, there Prabhupada is referring to the pure devotional service when he says devotional service begins at that stage? Yes. Yeah, Brahma Bhutta. If you come to Brahma Bhutta, that's, you know, you've transcended the material nature. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you've come to the platform of Brahman. So you've transcended the modes of nature. So that's pure devotional service. Of course, you have to go on. You have to go on from there. But that's where devotional service begins. Devotional service, we're talking about pure devotional service. So it begins on the platform of Brahman. Yeah. You may be going through the, the motions of devotional service without actually being on the platform of Brahman. So that's not actually, it's mixed with the modes of nature. But if you've actually come to the platform of Brahman, then you should have transcended the modes of nature. Thank you. All right? So that's the, the second verse. Of, and then the third verse goes on to describe about the importance of faith. Text number three. Those who are those who are not faithful in this devotional service cannot attain me, O conqueror of enemies. Therefore, they return to the path of birth and death in this material world. So then Prabhupada discusses about faith in that purport, about different kinds of faith. There's the first class, the second class, and third class. So somebody's faith is very weak, somebody's faith is intermediate, and somebody's faith is strong. So different levels of devotees. And Prabhupada explains about how the person may be of very weak faith. He, if he stays, if his faith is weak, then he may leave. He's going to fall down from devotional service, cannot remain on that stage. So in the beginning, we may be weak in faith. We have to come to the, at least to the second level. If we come to the second level, then we will, not, then we will stay in Krishna consciousness. 
But if our faith is always weak, we have doubts, then we won't remain in Krishna consciousness. So very important for us to come out of the modes of nature, to develop our faith. And how do you get faith? Where does faith come from? By association with devotees. Yes, right. You have to associate with devotees. And you have to associate with the right devotees. You have to associate with devotees who have faith. And there may be people who are in the guise of devotees, but they don't have faith. And they simply talk bad and criticize. So get out of that association. Don't hear, don't stay in that kind of association. If the people themselves are weak and always critical, critical, criticizing other devotees, you don't want to be with them. You want to leave that association and you want to find proper association which can help you to progress in Krishna consciousness. All right. So then, text number four then goes on. Someone read. After explaining in verse 4 that all beings rest in him, in verse 5 Krishna says the opposite, that they do not rest in him. This contradictory language is meant to show that he is personally aloof from the workings of the universes and that such functions are carried out by his energies. Surrender unto me. Okay, so text 4. Let's have a look at text number 4. By me, in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervading. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. So what is this unmanifested form? How is it described? What's the Sanskrit? Yes? Abhyakta Murtina, yes, the Abhyakta Murtina, the by me in my unmanifested form. So what is Krishna talking about then? What is this unma unmanifested form which is pervading the universe? His energy? Yes. Which energy? Huh? Amatma feature of the Lord. Sorry, what did you say? Uh, the Paramatma feature of the Lord of Maharashtra. Yes, could be Paramatma. Paramatma is also all pervading. Yes. Brahman. That could be Brahman also. Brahman. Yes, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. The Brahman. The Brahman is all pervading. Everything is the energy of Brahman, transformation of Brahman. And Paramatma is also everywhere. So Krishna is pervading everything. He's in everything. He said, by me this entire universe is pervading. All beings are in me. But, then he says, I am not in them. <laughs> right? And then he says the opposite. And so, then we'll read. So, and what are some examples, some analogies given? Read through the purport, text number four. Nopa talks about a king and the government, that a king has a government which is uh, the manifestation of king's energy, and the different government departments are the energetic of the king. Yes, right. The government, right? Different. So, how does it relate? How to understand the example? They said the government and different departments put it all together, tie it all together. So in the same way, what? Uh, the different demigods are taking care of uh, different departments in the material creation. Okay. And uh, Krishna is present everywhere, but he is still aloof from all this. And his energies are all forbidden and he's taken care by them and he's not directly getting involved in all the uh, activities. 
Well, you say the demigods, we could simply say the government. You were talking about the government, then you talked, to, now you're talking about the, dem, the government of the demigods. Okay. Uh, Prabhupada talks about the government, he just says the government, he didn't mention demigods. Anyway, if you want, you could see demigods, but again, de demigods, we can't see them either. We don't see Krishna, we don't see demigods either. We're talking about the demigods, they're also unmanifested. But the government we actually see, we see the government, right? And we know the government, there are many departments. And who's the head of the government? The king. Okay, a king, if you have a king. I mean, we don't have many kings these days, but in the past we had kings, yeah. You can say there's a king in charge of the government, or there's a, the prime minister, or the president, or whatever, he's the head of the government, and he has his ministers, and he has his... Uh, different government departments, right? So, what's the example now? The government, there are many departments. So how does the, how does the, is, is the president there in every department? He can't be present at all the departments, but he can be present at the particular department all the time. Right, he can't be there, he can't be personally present. So, so in the same way, Lord Krishna, it says, by me in, in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. So, all beings rest in him, they're all in him. It's all Krishna's energy in that sense, that they're all in, contained within the energy of Krishna. But Krishna is not there, but he's overseeing it. He's aloof, as, you, as one of the Mataji's said, he's aloof from it all, right? So that example is there in the purport, it's a nice example. Is there any other example? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So, uh, sunshine is uh, present everywhere, thus, but uh, uh, sun is not there. Uh, sun is uh, far in the sky, but it's sunshine. It's uh, through sunshine it, it shows the presence everywhere. So like that, the God, uh, Lord is far away, but his uh, uh, his uh, energy is present everywhere, which moves the world. Okay. Is that example given here? No, Maharaji. Not, not in this particular one. Oh. Okay. Yes, it is uh, present in the second last paragraph, last line. It is there, Maharaj. The second. second last paragraph, last line. Okay. Last line. Can you read it for me? Just as the sunshine is spread all over the universe, the universe of the, the energy of the Lord is spread all over the creation, and everything is resting in that energy. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, that's text four. Let's go on to text number five. Text number five. And yet, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, I have a question here. So, when, how to understand this for uh, this phrase that when Krishna says "Nacham Teshu Avastita," that I am not in them. So, what uh, like in as a Paramatma, Krishna is there in every living entity's heart, right? Yeah. So, how we can understand this phrase? Yeah. I'm not in them. Well, he's, he's, he's saying all beings are in me. He said all beings are in me, but I am not in them. And so, some, Krishna's talking about his own self, right? Krishna's aloof from everything. 
that he may be there as a Paramatma, but he himself, as Bhagavan, he's aloof from everything. He's in the spiritual world. He's in his Goloka with his devotees. He's enjoying his Leelas there. And so he, he has his uh, expansions in the form of the Super Soul there, all pervading everything. But he himself is not there. He keeps himself aloof. Thank you, Maharaj. Got it. Just like Prabhupada said about Ambarish Ford, you know, the, 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 one devotee was saying to Ambarish, is this where you work? When they came past the Ford office, the big building, the office, the Ford buildings, the office workers, they said, is this where you work? And Prabhupada said, he doesn't work, he's the proprietor. And so like that, you know, Krishna is the proprietor, he doesn't have to go to office. He doesn't have to go to office. Sometimes he may come, rare. he has his incarnations on schedule, he will come. But he's not every day there, you know, he's not obliged that he has to come. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. Got it. Okay, going ahead, text number five. And yet, everything that is created does not rest in me. Behold my mystic opulence. Although I am the maintainer of all living entities, and although I am everywhere, I am not a part of this cosmic manifestation, for myself is the very source of creation. All right, so we hear now, we hear about the, this Yogam Aishwaram, right? We heard about the Avyatta Murtina, and now it's Yogam Aishwaram, the mystic opulence. This is my mystic opulence. Behold my mystic opulence. What is, this myst what is Krishna's mystic opulence? What is Krishna referring to? Someone, can someone tell me? This uh, material manifestation, Maharaj? You have to read the purport, Prabhu. You'll get the answer in the purport. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah, so here the Lord says that uh, uh, though the whole universe uh, moves and uh, through his energy, but he is not directly uh, uh, involved. Like some of the where the places, the cartoon shows that somebody is holding the earth on the shoulder. So it is nothing like that. Like the person who is holding the uh, earth on the shoulder is getting feeling tired. So it is nothing like that. Like uh, in, in material world, what we perceive that everything is uh, moving uh, around each other through the gravitational force. And this gravitational force are what we, we try to cons uh, understand in the material world. Basically, so this is the energy of the Lord which is moving. So, but Lord himself is not directly involved in, uh, uh, in, in managing the entire uh, uh, universe. Yes. But you haven't really answered my question. I mean, what you say is okay, that's there. But are you saying that's Krishna's mystic opulence? Yes, Maharaj. So that is the mystic opulence uh, uh, which is being talked about. That That is the opulence through which the whole universe is uh, uh, operating uh, without 
his direct involvement. So that's why he is aloof. But his mystic opulence, which is running the entire universe. Yeah. Yeah, it comes at the end of the first paragraph here. He, but he is different from space. He is differently situated. Therefore, the Lord says that although they are situated in my inconceivable energy, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I am aloof from them. This is the inconceivable opulence of the Lord. That he's, he's aloof from everything. That although they're all situated in his energy, but he, he's aloof from it all. He lets the energy take care of it. Although everything is resting on him, he is aloof. The planetary systems are floating in space. And this space is the energy of the Supreme Lord. But he is different from space. He is differently situated. So this is his Yogam Aishwaram. That everything is arranged. And at the same time he can be aloof from it. Lord Krishna can be aloof from it. So here, from surrender unto me, they say, verse 4, all beings rest in him. Verse 5 says the opposite. They don't rest in him. This contradictory language is meant to show that he is personally aloof from the workings of the universe and that such functions are carried out by his energies. And we see this kind of contradictory thing in Ishopanishad where it says tadejati tadnaijati taddure tadvantike the lord walks he doesn't walk he's far away he's very near as well and so it's explained when there is contradictions this is to indicate the inconceivable potency of the lord so again inconceivable potency yogam aishwara right? mystic potencies of the lord so we can understand why, why this knowledge is so confidential, that it, it's so inconceivable, that one has to have real faith to hear very carefully, to hear with faith and try to understand. All right. So text five describes like that. Then text number six. Understand that as the mighty wind blowing everywhere rests always in the sky, all created beings rest in me. So Krishna is giving an example in text number 6. Krishna is giving an example. Prabhupada explains, for an ordinary person it is almost inconceivable how the huge material creation is resting in him. But the Lord is giving an example which may help us to understand. The sky may be the biggest manifestation we can conceive. And in that sky, the wind or air is the biggest manifestation in the, in the, in the cosmic world. The movement of the air influences the movements of everything. But although the mind, although the, the wind is great, it is still situated within the sky. The wind is not beyond the sky. Similarly, all the wonderful cosmic manifestations are existing by the supreme will of God, and all of them are subordinate to that supreme will. Okay, so 
text number six is the example to help us to understand how this arrangement is going on, the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. The example of the wind situated in the sky. Then text number seven. O son of Kunti, at the end of the millennium, all material manifestations in, enter into my nature. And at the beginning of another millennium, by my potency, I create them again. So we hear about the, the creation of the material world, how it's all manifest, and then it's dissolved, and then it's again created again. At the end of the millennium, everything enters into my form. Which form is that? It's a Arno the child Vishnu or Mahavishnu. Yes, it may be, or it may be a partial annihilation. It may be just simply the partial annihilation at the end of the day of Brahma. You know, there's a complete annihilation at the end of the life of Brahma when everything would enter into Karana Dakshai Vishnu. But there's partial annihilations also at the end of the day of Brahma, when they would enter into Garbha Dakshai Vishnu. Like that. So we have, we read about the, the temporary nature of the creation and how it's all going on under the the will of Lord Krishna. By my potency, I create them again. Then text number eight, the whole cosmic order is under me, under my will. It is automatically manifested again and again. And under my will, it is annihilated at the end. So the material world is being described temporarily, under Krishna's will. It is manifested and it is destroyed and then again manifest like this. Again and again the day comes and again the night falls, as Krishna says in other places. Text number nine. O Dhananjaya, all this work cannot bind me. I am ever detached from all these material act activities, seated as though neutral. So this is Lord Krishna's position. He's above everything. He's aloof. He's seated as though neutral. We often hear this about Krishna, how he's aloof from everything, how he's neutral. And we are encouraged also to be neutral, not to be too much overwhelmed by the situation of the material world. And then text number 10, the nice verse, Maya Dyakshina Prakriti Suyate Sacharacharam. This material nature, which is one of my energies, is working under my direction, O son of Kunti, providing all moving and non-moving beings under my direction this under my direction, O son of Kunti, uh, this world was created and annihilated again and again. So text 10 is often quoted by Prabhupada. It's a nice verse to know, memorization verse. Maya Jakshena Prakriti. Right? Let's see. Here's the summary of these verses. Text 4 to 10. 
Yeah. Someone like to read? Although all living entities are within Krishna, are dependent on Krishna and are supported by Krishna, they nevertheless act independently. How can one who is completely dependent act independently? This is an inconceivable feature of the relationship between the living entities and Krishna. Okay, this is the inconceivable feature. This is the Yoga Maishwaram. How can How can one who is completely dependent act independently? So who is independent? Is the living entity independent? Yes? Lord is independent and living entity is also partially independent. All living entities are within Krishna, are dependent on Krishna and are supported by Krishna. They nevertheless act independently. So as you say, we have some partial independence. How can one who is completely dependent act independently? So who is acting independently? The living entities, right? Yes, Prabhupada. The living entities are acting independently. This is the inconceivable feature of the relationship between the living entities and Krishna. That we are meant to be dependent, but we act independently. We are completely dependent on Krishna. But we have that mood that I am independent, I can do what I like. So this is something of the inconceivable relationship between the Lord and the living entities. In what way are we dependent on Krishna? Can you describe to me how we are dependent on Krishna? Hare Krishna Maharaj, so in uh, Paramatma future, uh, Lord is present in everybody's heart and He is the facilitator, facilitator He is the observer and also the uh, influencer. So whatever uh, we are uh, thinking, he is only facilitating. So that way uh, we are dependent. But at the same time, he is allowing the jiva to uh, enjoy the way it want to uh, enjoy. So that way he is not controlling uh, the living entity. But at the same time, he is facilitating and that way he is providing the full independence by facilitating what the living entity desire uh, to have it. So can somebody tell me what ways are we dependent on Krishna? What are we dependent for? Because... Uh, no, 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 let somebody else answer. Give somebody else a chance. Yes. In a way, we are dependent for everything. Uh -huh. like we, we, in a way, we are dependent for everything. Like, so, uh, tell me. We, uh, for example, we get the material bodies. So, I mean, we cannot choose, uh, I mean, that karma system. I mean, everything has been designed by Krishna. And so, in a way, for everything, we are dependent on Krishna. Yeah, and I'd like to hear some practical things which we are dependent on. Maharaj, uh, I don't know whether it's correct, but uh, Krishna is the seed uh, giver. He is the father of everything, so we are actually dependent on him for our existence. 
Yeah? So how do you maintain your existence? Oxygen. Yes, that's one thing you need. You need oxygen. Like food, shelter, yes, right. everything comes from Krishna only. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. That you, you see in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks more about maintenance, how he's maintaining everyone in the universe, providing everything. We need the heat of the sun. Without the heat of the sun, it would be unbearable for us. If there was no heat of the sun, it would be so cold and so damp. We need rain, we need water, we need to be able to grow food, and grains and so on, all of these different things. They're all arranged, but they're all provided. It's all due to Krishna's support system. So we're totally dependent on Krishna, we're dependent on him for the light of the sun and the moon. The moon puts the juice, in, the, the juice in the vegetables, the taste in the vegetables come from the moon. Oh, so many different aspects are there in the material world. The fire of digestion in our body to digest food, all of these different things. This is all the arrangement of Krishna. So we are totally dependent on Krishna. But we act independently. We are thinking, I know, I can do it, I, my, I myself, I can arrange. So this is the inconceivable feature that we're in this material world, but we're not recognizing how dependent we are. Please read. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, the governmental business of a king like Amrish Maharaj is carried out by his ministries, while the... By his... Carried out by his... Ministers. Ministers, yes. So, while the uninvolved king merely remains present, all the same, unless the king is present on his throne, the ministers are incapable of doing anything. In the same way, unless Krishna gives his support as the supervisor, material nature cannot do anything. Okay. So, this is like the example we had here. Yeah. The, the government business, you need the king. So Maharaj Ambarish is there as a king, but at the same time he's not doing everything. The, king, the uninvolved king merely remains present, but he has to be present. If he's not present, then nothing gets done. The ministers can't decide anything. But the same way, unless Krishna gives his support, as a supervisor, material nature cannot do anything. So Krishna is behind. Krishna sanctions the actions of the material nature. The living entity desires, the Lord sanctions it, and material nature facilitates. Okay. I don't know if you can do it. You could quickly look through this. How many people do we have? In the class? How many people are here tonight? Three, five, five. Hmm? Twenty-five. Twenty-five? Twenty-four. Twenty-four? Okay. So we want how many how many groups have we got? Let me see. Oh, wait. One, two, three, four, five. Five into twenty, uh, like five groups. Yeah. Five groups, one group of four, one group of nine. So, group one, nine four. Group two, nine five. Group three, nine six. Group four, nine nine. And group five, nine ten. What we want you to do, yeah. You may, you try to draw if you have time, you can draw. If not, you can simply tell us. Give us, we want Krishna's statements, Sanskrit words, important Sanskrit words and phrases, Prabhupada's statements, the significant things which you feel. We want to hear the examples, the analogies. All right? So five groups, 
each group can work through one one section. Have we got that? Quickly, you can do this. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so we've got five groups, each group. Nine, four, nine, five, nine, six, nine, 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 ten. Just give us the main points from this. Tell us the analogies and give us the examples. Okay, we'll give you 10 minutes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Are you, are you getting it? Okay, okay. you got the main points, the analogy. Actually, for me, these few verses are very difficult to understand, Maharaj. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying very hard to understand it. <laughs> they are, they are, they are quite bewildering. I very, think. very. I, I, I really could not get <laughs> It's very, very inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to hear them again and again, you know. And, yes. you, and you have to repeat. You have to repeat, you know. Yes, Maharaj. You just repeat Prabhupada's words as he explains it, and he gives the examples. Mm 
Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Mm. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Are you okay? Are you, have you got the main points from the verse? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, can I close the room? You picked a spokesman. Who's going to be the spokesman? Yeah? We haven't decided, uh, Maharaj. So, uh, Prabhu? Uh, can you need a spokesman? Yes, Mother. Yes, Mother. Yeah, good. Okay. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can we, can we close the rooms, Prabhu? Sure, Maharaj. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, is everyone back? Yes, my Lord. Okay, so can we, who's in group one? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay, Prabhu, would you like to tell us the main points? Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, my humble apologies, we are just, uh, you know, winding up the things. Uh, may I kindly request if any other group is ready that you can present. Maybe next in line I will present Prabhuji with your Maharaj. With your permission, Maharaj. Okay, we'll leave, but usually, you know, you're 9 4. Okay, so the next group, 9 5, are you ready? Yes? Group number 2? <laughs> Who's in group 2? We, we are also not ready, Maharaj. I think. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah. Really? I, you know, just give me what you've got, you know. Have you got the analogies, the examples? Uh, so yes, Maharaj. Maharaj. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, okay. 
any uh, in any way since um, yeah, since all of them are getting ready i will go ahead Ma- maharaj with your permission yeah please yeah so uh, the analogy presented here is that of a king who heads a government uh, you know uh, uh, the king heads a government which is but the manifestation of the king's energy the different governmental departments are nothing but the energies of the king and each department is resting on the king's power but still one cannot expect the king to be present in every department personally similarly all the manifestations that we see and everything that exists both in this material world as well as in the spiritual world are resting on the energy of the supreme personality of godhead he is present everywhere by his personal representation only the diffusion of his through the uh, diffusion of his different energies the 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 summon bottom of this thing uh, you know the the uh, example here presented is that the king creates all these you know uh, all this creation is uh, i mean the king creates all the rules and regulations to be followed in the different departments of uh, his kingdom he he creates that but he need not be personally present in every department his his rules and regulations run those department in the same way krishna is the supreme personality of god and he controls he creates everything he need not be physically present there that is Prabhu maharaj what is uh, being conveyed here yes and when it comes to a example the same example is again presented here that the king heads the government which is but the manifestation of the king's energy the different governmental departments are nothing but the energies of the king and each department is resting on the king's power yes okay very good yes so this is verse number 4 right yes maharaj by Thank me, you, maharaj. By Thank me in my unmanifested form the entire entire universe is pervaded all beings are in me but i am not in them right yes maharaj okay so the king is not in every department but he's overseeing yes, everything okay very good thank you thank we'll, you maharaj we'll go ahead to the next group any significant sanskrit words in that verse uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, I believe you are asking about 9.4, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, in that, uh, uh, there is one uh, uh, um, verse which is given, uh, Brahma Samhita 5.38, uh, Preman Jana Churita Bhakti Vilochana uh, yes, uh, Santaha Sadve Hridyeshu Biolakkenti. Lord says that I am everywhere and everything is in me, but still I am aloof. So what, what's it quote, how come that relate, uh, the verse Preman Jana Charita Bhakti Bila, how does that verse relate to this? We have to have Prima, is it? We have to have Prima in order to see the Lord in everything. Yeah. Only the devotees can uh, have that uh, special vision of seeing uh, the presence of Krishna everywhere and everything, Maharaj. Ah, yes, only the devotees who have Prima have that love on their eyes they can see the Lord in everything okay also you have to maybe mention about the avyakta murtina right that yes, is a significant term there also the unmanifested my unmanifested form okay Prabhu thank you very much thank you Maharaj we'll go ahead and then the next group, to group number two. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So here, uh, so some important uh, phrase from the verse is that uh, Yogam Aishwaryam, mm-hmm. the, the inconceivable mystic power of Krishna, which has been elaborately described in the purport. And um, some analogies that Prabhupada gives uh, is that of the Atlas, that sometimes we see a picture of Atlas holding the globe on his shoulder. He seems to be very tired holding this great earthly planet. Such an image should not be entertained in connection with Krishna's upholding this created universe. 
Yeah, this this atlas is actually there in New York, you know. If you in New York City on Fifth Avenue, the Rockefeller Center, Prabhupada must have gone there because it's right there on Fifth Avenue at Rockefeller Center. They have this big bronze statue of Atlas. So Prabhupada put these things in the, in his books, you know. It talks about how Atlas is laboring, struggling, so heavy. But for Krishna, it's not a big sweat, right? Krishna is not struggling to pick up the planets. Is that his Yoga Maishwaram? Would you? Is that Yoga Aishwaram that that Krishna doesn't have to struggle to labor to hold the planets, planets in place? Is that what Krishna means when he talks about Yoga Aishwaram? Yes, Maharaj. So, so he is different from this material manifestation, yet everything is resting on him. He is aloof from them. Yes. Can you tell me a bit more? What is this Yogam Aishwaram? Maharaj, Krishna maintains this universe through his uh, inconceivable potencies. So, he doesn't have to make effort like, just like that atlas holding the globe uh, and you know being tired krishna runs uh, uh, through his inconceivable potencies so just like you give the example of a king that the king is there but the entire administration is run through the ministers so uh, he's there but so many in potencies are uh, you know maintaining uh, the world okay just by his glance he can hold the planets in place Everything goes on by his mystic potencies, right? Krishna impregnated Maya through his glance on him. Yeah. And all the uh, Jeeva, Jeevatmas, uh, you know, were transferred to Maya through. Mm. Right. So, can we can read the verse? Please read the verse again. Translation. And yet everything that is created does not rest in me. Behold my mystic opulence. Although I am the maintainer of all living entities and although I am everywhere, I am not a part of this cosmic manifestation. For myself is the very source of creation. So, it appears contradictory, right? That Krishna says, although I am everywhere, and how is he everywhere? How is he in everything? Because he's the source of everything. He's the source of everything, yes. But he says, although I am everywhere, so Krishna is everywhere, in what form is he everywhere? As Paramatma is pervaded. Yes, as Paramatma is pervading. You see in the tenth chapter, when we go on to the tenth chapter, Krishna says, What need is there for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire creation. Vishtabhyahamigam Krishnam ekam shenas titojagat. A single fragment. And what is that fragment? That is Paramatma. It's a, it's a single fragment of Krishna. He's pervading and supporting the entire creation. And he's holding all the planets in position. How is he doing it? By his potency. You know, we take up, if we take some sand, some dust and hold it in our hands, open our hands, the dust all falls to the ground. But Krishna's got so many planets in the universe and they're all floating in space. It's inconceivable. Of course, they will say, oh, gravity. But who's, where's the gravity coming from? It's coming from Krishna. It's Krishna's potency. This inconceivable potency. This is his 
mystic opulence. So he's pervading and supporting everything and he is the very source of creation. But he says, I am not a part of this cosmic manifestation, for myself is the very source of creation. Although I'm everywhere, I'm not a part of this. So again, he's aloof. That's a so you can see also Lord Chaitanya's philosophy, achintya beda beda tattva. He's one and at the same time he's different. <laughs> he said, although he's everywhere in everything, I'm not a part. So we see that, ex this example. Okay, next group, group number three. Yes, which verse are you doing, Madhiji? Uh, 9.6. 9.6. Can you read the verse for us? Understand that as a mighty wind blowing everywhere, rest always in the sky, all created beings rest in me. So the Sanskrit relevant verse here, Maharaj, is Sarvani Bhutani Masthaneti, that all created beings rest in Krishna. And Krishna says here that although we see the wind in the sky, uh, it is uh, within the sky, the wind is not beyond the sky. Similarly, all that we see in this material world, it, has, it is subordinate to that Supreme God. And the movement of the air which influences everything and we see the sky in the wind, all that we see, it is all contained within the sky. And uh, the sky is always aloof from the activities of the wind. So similarly, all Krishna's activities, the activities that are uh, there in the material world, Krishna is aloof from the activities. Like the sky is aloof from the activities of wind. And Prabhupada writes here in the uh, first, first uh, he quotes from uh, Brahma Samhita that uh, the sun and the movement of the sun is described. And it says that uh, Krishna, the one eye, the uh, sun is considered to be one of the eye of the Supreme Lord and it diffuses heat and light, but it's still moving in the prescribed orbit by the will of Krishna. So all that we see, and uh, we see the entire, we find the evidence of this material manifestation, it appears to be very wonderful and great, but everything is completely under the control of Krishna. That's, uh, that's how Prabhupada conclu concludes the uh, purport in this verse. Okay, yeah, very nice. Very thorough. Thank you, Madhiji. Good. Okay, next group, group number four. Thank you, Madhiji. Yes, Prabhu. What, which verse are you doing? We are doing 9.9. 9.9? Yes, please read it. Yes, so the main Sanskrit word here highlighted is Vaisula Prabhupada is Muda Sinama. That means Krishna is neutral. He behaves as a neutral of uh, all the activities. It, say, it says that all this work cannot bind me and I am ever detached from all these material activities. The example predicted here is of the High Court judge sitting on his bench. By his order, the, like the High Court judge orders many uh, punishment and uh, reward, but he is not affected by the gain and loss. Similarly, the Lord is always neutral, although he has uh, his own uh, attachment in the material world. So, the Lord is uh, neutral to all this and is not uh, directly related to any of the material activities. Okay. Yeah. So, the judge appears to be partial. You know, somebody may say, well, well look, you punish, you're punishing me, but you rewarded the other man. Why are you punishing me? So, is that, now how is he neutral? Uh, the judge, actually, he doesn't suffer any personal gain or loss. He just, he just uh, makes his own judgment, which, uh, which he thinks is to correct, or according to the laws, he 
just passes its judgment uh, for the benefit of the common mass. But personally, he is not affected by the game or loss. Okay, he doesn't have any self interest in the yes. matter. Yes, like that. Right? So somebody is punished or rewarded, it's, it's what they deserve, right? They get what they, say, they, what they deserve. And the judge is just the one who sanctions them. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes? And then the final group, group number five? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Hare Krishna. Sloka number 9.10. Yes, Prabhu. Sloka is Maya Gyakshena Prakriti Shuya Teja Saracharam Ketuna Nena Kamteya Jagat Vipari Vartate. So, in this, the uh, important point is Maya Atyakshena Prakriti Shuya Te. So, Krishna is uh, uh, he is uh, the director who is uh, which is uh, this material nature is uh, one of uh, my energies is working under my direction. That is the point Krishna is telling in this. Uh, verse and uh, he is uh, uh, directing all the non-moving and moving uh, uh, nature in this material world and he is the as a seed giving father for all the types of living entities he is sowing the souls in this material world and uh, although he is aloof from all the activities but he is the supreme director and as based on the desires and the free will of the living entity they are getting the body that's what uh, Prabhupada is mentioning and he comes, uh, Krishna is coming along with us as Paramatma. Each and every time he is uh, Achyuta coming uh, with us as Paramatma and glancing the material nature. And because of his, just by a glance, this material nature is being directed. There is an analogy given. What is the uh, similarity between the material one, the Supreme Lord is uh, same like a fragrance and a flower. So, uh, when there is a fragrant flower before someone, the fragrance is touched by the smelling power of the person. If the smelling and the flower are detached from one another. This analogy is uh, given for the similarity between the material world and the supreme personality of God. Okay. So, you know, if material nature, I mean, you know, Material nature, I thought material nature is controlled by Mother Durga. You're saying Krishna controls the material nature. Uh, Durga is under the control of uh, Krishna. Oh. So, uh, if I uh, see the material nature is controlled uh, uh, by Durga Devi, not uh, only the devotees will come across that, uh, not uh, uh, under the influence of Maya Devi. So the devotees will come under the direct control of uh, Krishna. Oh. And so, material nature is the father or material nature is the mother? Krishna is the supreme father. Who is the mother? Radharani. Huh? Radharani, Srimati Radharani. <laughs> no, no, no. Material nature is the mother. The body, the body is coming from the material nature. Yes, sir. He is sowing the seeds to the material nature for us. Yes, right. The Krishna, the Krishna is the father, material nature is the mother. Everywhere has a father and mother. And so, so Krishna is the father of all living entities, material nature is the mother. We get the body. So material nature provides so many different bodies. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's see. Are you able to see the slide? Yes, my Oh, good. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, within the material world, let's see the main points here. Here we have text number four, the misconception that the Lord loses his existence. That's an important point, right? It's a misconception to think that Krishna loses his existence. 
He's always a person. He maintains his individuality. Some, the Mayavadis, they have the idea, ultimately, Krishna comes into this world. He's just coming from the Brahman. Ultimately, there's only the Brahman. So they think that Krishna loses his individuality. That's a, an important point which is brought out in text number four. We heard about Atlas. Text number six, Krishna himself cites an example of how the wind rests in space. Yes, we covered that. Nine, the judge punishing and rewarding different persons. And ten, the analogy of a person smelling a flower but not touching it. Yes, we heard that. Okay, so we covered all these points tonight. This is the interesting section here, how Krishna relates with the material world. Here's some, another point from text 10, which we didn't hear. Maya Jyakshena Prakriti. Maya means by me. And Adi means from above. Aksha means eyes. So, Maya Jyakshena means under my eyes. Everything is done under Krishna's supervision. So, this is the meaning here. Maya Jyakshena Prakriti. This material nature is moving under my direction. In other words, everything is done under Krishna's supervision. Aksha, the eyes, and Adi, from above, Maya, by me. An interesting way to understand this verse. Okay, so that's the end. All right, so... We covered uh, confidential knowledge, more confidential knowledge, and most confidential knowledge. Everyone's okay on that point? Different ways of understanding that. Confidential, yes, confidential knowledge means, as described in chapter 2, difference between the body and the soul. More confidential knowledge was described in chapter 7 and 8 about nature of devotional service and the most confidential knowledge is going to come in chapter number nine and we'll hear about Krishna's relationship with his pure devotees. And then we spoke about uh, the Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam Vaish and the different points which are made that this knowledge is the king of knowledge, it's the most confidential knowledge. It's confidential because most people are not qualified to hear this. First of all, they have to understand. They have to understand who they are, they're not the body. If we try to explain to them the confidential dealings of Lord Krishna with his pure devotees, it will be very difficult for them to understand because they haven't understood the beginning. So they have to learn. First of all, they're not the body. We have to learn how to control the mind and senses, the trouble we have controlling our mind and senses, and gradually become qualified to hear more confidential things. So this knowledge is confidential, and it, but it's also pavitram, it's purifying destroys all sinful reactions, all faces of sin. Remember, there's a, there's, there's a manifest sinful reactions and unmanifest sinful reactions and there's the kuta and the bija, the different stages of sin. So they're all destroyed by devotional service. That is the power of devotional service. So it's pavitram and uttamam, it's the highest. We heard at the end of chapter 6 that bhakti yoga is the highest, yoga uttamam. And it pratyak, pratyaksha and avagamam. Pratyaksha is directly perceived. We can directly experience the nature of devotional service. We feel transcendental pleasure engaging in Krishna's service. 
And we feel the purification, the changes which come about by engaging in devotional service. We can feel that devotional service is something so different from the material world. Serving Krishna gives us a special taste, a special experience which we cannot get in the material life. So that is what attracts us to devotional service. Just as Narada Muni was attracted. And then Pradyakshavagamam Dharmyam Susukam joyfully performed and Avyayam everlasting. It's the eternal nature of the soul. The Mayavadis, they do devotional service for some time, but their idea is that they'll give it up when they get liberated. But for a devotee, we just want to go on serving. We don't, we never, we want more and more service. There's no end. Devotional service is et eternal. We speak of sanatan dharma. It's eternal. So avyayam, devotional service is everlasting. And susukam, joyfully performed. We, Prabhupada liked to see always the happy, smiling faces. Okay, so those were all described. We spoke a little bit about Narada Muni, how he directly perceived, how he got the mercy through the association with great sages coming to his home, taking their remnants and serving them and being with them. And finally, we've been speaking about the Lord's relationship with the material world and the living entities. How everything is dependent on Krishna, we're to totally dependent on him. But at the same time he's aloof from everything. So we heard about his Yogam Aishwaram, how he has his mystic potencies by which he can oversee everything, maintain everything through his energy. And we had the examples, different examples about how the wind blows but it always rests in space. So everything's always under the control of Krishna. And then material nature. This is also under Krishna's direction. Mm -hmm. Brahma Samhita is described how Mother Durga is worshipped by all people as the creating, maintaining and annihilating deity of the mundane world. But she's moving like a shadow under the control of Lord Krishna. The relationship between Lord Krishna and Mother Durga is like that, like a shadow. The, 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 the object and the shadow. Mother Durga is like the shadow of Krishna. She's not independent. She's under the control of Krishna. And this was realized also by Vyasadeva in Srimad Bhagavatam. When Vyasadeva sat in meditation, he saw the Lord and he saw the external potency and how the external potency was under the full control of the Lord. Okay, are there any questions? No? Okay, so we'll be back tomorrow night. Yes, Mother. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Thank you, Prabhupada.